My next guest is a fractional CTO. So what does that mean? He's a consultant that can help multiple startups. He specifically focuses on structuring the software engineering team and the architecture so a tech company can scale. Some of the things we talk about are red flags to look for when hiring offshore teams. Should you spend more time on building your idea or validating your idea? What is one big thing that has held him back in his career? And what is one thing that helped him succeed in his career? And a whole lot more. If you're an entrepreneur looking to start a tech company or scale a tech company, this episode will be perfect for you. Please welcome Brian Childress. Brian, welcome to the show. Sean, it's great to be here. I really appreciate it. Indeed. Thanks for joining me. So why don't you kick us off and tell us about your background? Yeah. So professionally, um, I am a fractional CTO. So I get uh, the privilege of being able to work with a number of different startups and small and medium businesses as they're building out their custom software solutions. Uh, my background is in software engineering, software architecture. So that's where I've spent the last uh, good 15 years of my professional career uh, and really enjoyed the opportunities to work in healthcare and in finance and consumer SaaS products. So a bit of, across the board as far as uh, the different industries uh, and technologies that I've had a chance to work with. Nice. Now, did you previously start, build, and sell a business or were you working for companies? Mostly working for companies. Um, there are a number of different startups that I've been you know, either a, a founder or a lead uh, founding engineer on. Uh, so there are quite a few of those. Uh, <laughs> most of those have uh, unfortunately never gotten to see the light of day, but certainly been in in a lot of different projects. But I've worked everywhere from small startups to Fortune 100 organizations. So before I, I've got a bunch of questions here teed up to dive into. One question, though, before we go through the list would be, can you kind of tell us a little bit more about a fractional CTO, like what are you what are you doing with customers? And we know it's fractional; it's not full time. Yeah, so it's it's one of those kind of new newer terms, especially for us here in the United States, uh, specifically in the technology realm. Now we do have fractional CMOS and CFOS; it's a fairly popular paradigm. So for me, I am working with teams and organizations, helping them to kind of lead uh, their software development practices. Most often I'm brought into projects when uh, they are either looking to scale the applications that they already have in place, or if there's a problem that they're trying to identify and solve for. So typically I'm not building uh, ground up, you know, brand new ideas or, or SaaS products. Most often I'm coming in after something's already been built and we're ready to head into the next phase. Got it. And you mentioned you're more consumer SaaS. So would you say you're more B2C or are you kind of a mix between B2C and B2B? Oftentimes I'm B2B. Uh, okay. It's kind of where I land. And then most of my uh, uh, customers, then they may be selling B2C, uh, but typically B2B is where I, I tend to hang out. Okay. All right. So one of the first questions I teed up is, what are some of the biggest challenges that non-technical founders face? Yeah, so non-technical founders, uh, they really, they kind of have a, a lot to overcome from a, a technical standpoint. And I think one of the biggest challenges that they have is that they they don't know what they don't know. And so unfortunately, when it comes to technology, oftentimes they hand over a lot of control of their business, of the software that they're trying to build. And unfortunately, it's too much control that they hand over. Uh, because technology can feel like this mysterious black box type of thing to a non-technical person, uh, you know, it's very confusing. It's very, you know, scary or, or fear-inducing. And so we we tend to try and find somebody that sounds and looks like they know about technology, and then we just hand over everything to them. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, we hand over complete control of, you know, ultimately the business that we're trying to build. And unfortunately, you know, I, I've seen that kind of go bad quite a few times. Can you, I, I love examples. Can you give an example? Yeah. So I was talking with a team maybe a couple months ago now, and they had hired a development agency uh, in a different country. And, you know, it doesn't matter kind of where they're located, but that was just kind of a, a scenario. And they had spent a hundred thousand dollars so far uh, to hire this development agency to you know, try and get 
things up and running. Um, so $100,000, at least six months had been spent working with the development agency and they had nothing. They had nothing to show for it. They had no wow. control. They had no code. They had, you know, they didn't know where the application that they had been shown was hosted. They they were basically out. They they couldn't take anything that they'd spent all that time and money on to take it to another developer. And so unfortunately, uh, they just kind of had to chalk it up to a very expensive lesson learned and, and moving on to the next. Sure. Uh, and unfortunately, th that type of story, you know, we kind of hear all too often. Absolutely. I'm going to get a little tactical here, but I'll kind of look at this through my lens. So I, my background, so you know, is about 17, 18 years in tech, um, primarily in project management roles. And what I found as a big failure, a lot of businesses make, especially new startups, is they will give kind of the requirements handed off to development team, and then they'll revisit in too long of durations between deliverables. So I found no matter if it's onshores or offshores, you need to create a high level of rigor and meeting with people every week. So you see, is this staying on track? And if not, you can quickly make corrections to get it right back on track. And if they're not delivering, you can cut those payments off immediately so you don't spend a hundred grand. Um, so with your experience, cause it sounds like you've got experience on not just the coding, but also the architecture. Do you kind of help put a framework in place regarding project management? I, I do, uh, I do. So. Typically, when I come into an organization, they already have some sort of project management in place. So I try and work within whatever they have, but really trying to, to drive it back to what is the business value? What is it that we're trying to build and how is this going to you know ultimately serve the business? Uh, so, yeah, I, I do bring in, you know, I, I've got a number of different tools in my toolbox. And really, as far as project management goes, you know, I try and align it with what the what I think is going to make the team and the business most successful, right? Mm -hmm. I, I try to not be too dogmatic about proposing certain approaches to project management. Just in my experience, we get too much resistance if we uh, try and force something on the the team or the project. Hundred percent agree because I've seen people that or organization yep. that runs kind of waterfall, and you come in with like your agile methodology, it, it like totally flips the thing on its head. It's like, no, <laughs> you don't want to do that, like. Use whatever framework you guys are comfortable with, but you know, create those touch points, create that rigor two to three times a week. I recommend and to keep people on track. And you can run those meetings how you want, but making sure you're doing testing every week, you're looking at results every week. It might be just be little things you get to see, but that way you keep that project on track. Now, with what you're doing, I would see you because you're more of a fractional CTO, you're probably not writing code like um like a full-time engineer so i assume you're probably doing more architecture work to make sure an organization is built to scale like they go from okay so you're at this level you're generating this amount of revenue you can handle this this number of clients i'm going to help you put the architecture in place so you can scale to 10x that is that kind of what you're doing absolutely yeah uh so 10x is really where I try and target. Uh, I, I try to not build for any more than that. Uh, it's usually, you know, thing we learn a lot in that where we are now getting to 10x, uh, and so we don't we don't design beyond that. Um, but scale is interesting because I I think about it in a few different ways that I'd, I'd love to share. Yeah, please. Yeah. So typically, when we talk about scale, as far as software goes, we usually think about scale as adding more users to the system, right? And that's sure. fairly straightforward, right? We have ten users; we want to have a hundred users. Um, and so, for that, you know, there's some fairly well trodden paths and approaches that we can take to to be able to do that. But for me, I'm also looking at scaling the number of engineers that I can bring onto the, the team, right? Can I add additional developers from other areas of the world, right? Can we now have a globally distributed development team? And what are some of the practices that are required there? And then the third way that I look at scaling is around how can we add more features to the platform where I don't have to come to my my project manager and say, well, you want to add this particular feature, but because we built the system in such a way, it's actually going to require quite a bit of rework for us to even be able to get to a place where we can then start to add yeah. this new feature. And so for me, that's where I'm really looking at how do we build the system? 
How do we architect it in a way that we can continue to add features along the way uh, that won't require huge you know, levels of effort in the future? I love that. We actually, to give you a quick case study here with Ticker, um, we have gone through three different versions of the web app. We're on the third version now, and this is where we'll probably stay for the long haul. But the second version was that in-between point between the MVP and where we're at today. And it was it was pretty much a mistake and it cost us about a year because mm. we really pigeonholed ourselves with the architecture. We could not add the features our customers were looking for. It was, it was a massive failure, but it was a, like a lesson learned. Let's fail forward, fail fast and keep things moving. But I wasn't exactly pleased with that experience. And it's like, this is where an architect is so critical to see that vision and understand the audience is probably going to want this, this, and this. So we need to be prepared to build that. So I see you coming into play, making that call and helping a, a, a team really build the right stack so they can scale for the customer. Yeah, it's such a critical component. Uh, being able to see not only in the short term, what did we what are we building in the next three months, but how is that going to get us to our goal that, you know, maybe 18 months into the future? And how do we balance that with not, you know, over engineering or making things too complex on either end of the spectrum? Sure. Can you share with us maybe some of the the red flags you look for when hiring offshore developers? Uh, communication is the very first one that I look okay. for. How how well do they communicate? How often do they communicate? In what ways do they communicate? Is it consistent? Am I getting the information that I'm looking for? Um, that's a really big one. Uh, from there, you know, if I feel comfortable with how we're communicating, um, one of the biggest indicators for me is how many questions do they ask? Uh, just are they continuing to ask questions to better understand what it is that we're building? What is the business that we're in? What are the problems that we're trying to solve? Because I think most often the horror stories that we hear about, you know, offshore development agencies or freelancers or anything along those lines is that they kind of operate almost like order takers. And we just say, hey, we want this thing. And they say, OK, I know how to build that thing. And they go and do that. And ultimately, it's you know, I think it's our responsibility as developers, as architects, to make sure that whatever it is that we're building is actually the thing that we should be building, that we should be focusing on, uh, so that we're aligning our, our technology initiatives with the, the business initiatives. Um, so that's a big one is how many questions do they ask and how deep do they go um, in those questions? Right. Um, here's, here's one for you. So when we were building the MVP, I actually went through two different teams and I had managed teams prior to this with numerous projects. Well, the first team said they could build a B2C SaaS and it was quickly determined after about three to four months and they they cannot build a SaaS. They can build websites, right? You name the platform, WordPress, whatever, they've got it covered, but to build a custom coded SaaS way out of their league, brought in a second guy who was decent, but couldn't get to like, um, what I would say world-class level with Ticker. Um, so how do you ask the right questions to really qualify people? Like, obviously you can ask, what have you done before and show me your portfolio? But if they don't have that, maybe they have the skills, but how would you kind of uncover if they have, if they truly have the skills to build a SaaS? So I always like to allow, you know, when I'm, whether I'm interviewing an engineer or I'm interviewing, you know, someone to potentially bring on as a partner, I want to learn more about their projects. And so what I'm listening for are some specific details within those projects that I'll continue to ask deeper questions about. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times, and you know, kind of back to our, our original question around, you know, the challenges that non-technical founders face is it's easy for us to throw around a lot of like keywords and you know and and technical jargon that makes it sound like we know what we're talking about, that we, you know, we know how to build these things. Right. And I think developers are, are extremely guilty of it. I've been guilty of it early in my career. Of, you're just trying to make ourselves feel smart or look mm -hmm. smart. So we just throw around a lot of words and acronyms uh, just as a way to kind of confuse people. Um, and unfortunately, it, it works. Right. And so, you know, but for me, because I've got that technical background, I'll continue to kind of ask deeper questions. And I want to understand how did they solve particular problems? When they talk about particular technologies, can they balance the, the pros and the cons of using a specific technology? Uh, and if they can't, 
then you know it it could be an indication that that's the only technology they know or that's the only one that they're willing to use. And for me, technology is just a tool. We want to make sure that we're choosing the right tool for the the given use case for the problem we're trying to solve. Um, and so, you know, I just want to make sure that they're able to kind of see a bit more broadly than, you know, outside of what they just have the most recent experience with. Sure. Right on. Um, another good one here is should a team be focused more on building their idea or validating their idea? I would argue validating. Absolutely. Uh, it's it's really, <laughs> especially coming from a technical standpoint, I know this, you know, I can say it's easy, but compared to validating an idea and actually getting it out into the marketplace and finding that ideal customer that's willing to pay you money for the thing that you're going to build, I think that's just so much more important than can we build this thing and how do we make it scalable and do we use Stripe or PayPal or some other platform? Like those things don't matter if we can't actually get someone that's inter interested enough to actually pay for the uh, for the product. So right. I really always encourage my founders, any teams that I'm working with to really validate ideas so deeply, right? Go beyond our friends and our family groups and really get out there and talk to our customers um, and potentially folks that may not be our customers and just try to understand what it would take to, to potentially convert them uh, mm -hmm. as well. It's just really, really important. I 100% agree. I know a lot of founders out there, and I was guilty of this in my earlier days, is build it and they will come philosophy. Build the dreams, right? Yeah. Um, and you don't want to do that because you could invest tens of thousands of dollars into something that nobody will use, nobody cares about. So how do you validate an idea? And the idea, or what I tell people, is try to go to MVP with the least amount of money and time spent. And in some cases, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, some cases that's presenting UIs, like have somebody put together UIs in like Figma or Photoshop, um, maybe a PowerPoint, maybe if you can put together something that's kind of basic with like Wix or Squarespace, it won't give you the full custom functionality, but provide them with an experience to at least have the conversations of what people, when they can start saying, I like that, but what if it could do this, this, and this, and then you write all that down and that's kind of your roadmap. So that's my philosophy on validation. I'd love to hear how you tactically approach validation. Uh, almost identical, uh, nice. honestly. So one of the very first phases for me that I suggest is to hire a designer to put together a clickable prototype, right? And you mentioned Figma, that's a fantastic tool for this type of thing. Get that in front of people so that they can start to see it. Because you know we really need that kind of visual connection mm -hmm. to what it is that we're building. It's, it's kind of tough. PowerPoint can do okay, but really having something that you can kind of click through and you see data moving, and even though it's it, it's all fake, that can be monumental and you know really extremely valuable. So I really encourage folks to kind of iterate on that clickable prototype before we get to custom development. Because once we get into custom development, you know that's where things get really expensive really really quickly. Yeah, and and that's where. People get so far down the road and invest so much money and realize, oh gosh, I just I spent the price of my home on something that nobody's going to use, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's heartbreaking to hear when folks yeah. will cash out their four hundred one k accounts to fund no. custom software development projects, and it you know they they go nowhere. It's devastating. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent agree. Avoid that. Um, all right, another question here, a little gear shift. What has held you back in your career? I think the biggest thing that's held me back, and I know a lot of folks, uh, you know, technical and maybe non-technical as well, uh, this feeling of imposter syndrome, right? Not feeling like you have the skills, you have the capability or knowledge. And so you you tend to kind of be much more reserved and less likely to kind of push yourself or put yourself out in front of your peers because you know what's you know the fear of judgment and you know if i make a mistake or say the wrong word then you know <laughs> my career is just over at that point and you know thankfully that's not actually true you know but that feeling can be overwhelming and you know it can lead to all sorts of things, you know, self sabotage, and you know, just really restraining your your ability to grow, um, and that's something that I've worked on a lot. Is that idea of of imposter syndrome, and how can I, 
leverage that feeling to continue to propel me forward. I want to dive into that a little bit further because a lot of people, even listeners, may be feeling the same thing. Imposter syndrome is very common. So how did you kind of help coach yourself through that? One of the most helpful things for me is, uh, so I like to create kind of lists, right? The things that I've achieved. And so for me, I created a, a list of all the accomplishments that, you know, for me, I shouldn't have been able to do, right? I have multiple patents in software development. I've held prestigious titles. I've, you know, worked at prestigious companies, all of those types of things that, you know, when we have an opportunity to kind of take a step back, it's like, wow, I, I have done a lot. I have really accomplished quite a few things. And really having that list to continue to reflect back on is like, no, I have done these things or something equivalent. I can do it again. And I, I can continue to push you know, myself to do even more. Uh, I found that to be hugely, hugely helpful. Even today, before I walk on, you know, stage to to give a, a conference talk or something, I'm still reflecting back on, you know, I have spoken in front of this many people before. And that I've found to be kind of a game changer for me. That's a great tip. Something, something we can all apply. Well, you love those tactical examples of what can we do today? So good one. Um, this is very similar. What has helped you succeed in your career? So I, I kind of have this kind of mental image of our comfort zone, right? And it's it's almost like I, I'm in a bubble and my goal is to push against the edges of that bubble, but not make it burst, right? So I'm really, the idea is that I'm pushing my comfort zone uh, just a little bit more, pushing against that fear and kind of really embracing it. Uh, for me, public speaking was one of those things that you know, in college, we were required to take a public speaking class, and I put it off till the very last semester possible. I barely passed. It would just, I, I would, it, I didn't gravitate towards it. It wasn't something that was for me. Um, and so I kind of went into this idea with that, you know, background. And so I really needed to push against that comfort zone and being willing to do that and recognize the the fear and the feelings that were there and and just continuing to to celebrate the small victories has really helped me to excel and kind of grow in my career but you know it it does require a bit of discomfort to get there yes i i love that so uh this is not pointing at you directly but most people who are like ctos or software engineers or architects they do lean to be more introverted highly technical highly analytical, heads down, very productive, and not public speakers, right? So <laughs> to push yourself outside of your comfort zone to, to go on stage and learn how to be a public speaker is, is very difficult. So um, it shows like just giving yourself the push and just push through those little barriers um, can go a long way because now I'm assuming you being on stage, being able to network more, uh, shake more hands, be out there more in front of people is probably bringing you more opportunities. Is that probably a correct assumption? You're absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. the connections that I've made, uh, being able to walk into a room and folks know me, but I've never met them. I mean, that's yeah. just, it's it's an incredible feeling. Yeah. So it's certainly opened up a lot of doors for me. Mm -hmm. This podcast episode is sponsored by Ticker. Ticker is a platform that helps you manage your own investments with confidence. Check this out. Let's search for Apple. You can see Apple is on sale. That's looking good. Score 61 out of 100 and margin of safety is 75%. Higher the score, the safer the investment. And the higher the margin of safety, the higher potential returns you can make. In this case, you can see the share price is 175 as of the recording of this video. And the upside potential, the fair value is 398. All right, let's look at a different stock. We'll go to GameStop. In this case, GameStop is overpriced, scores 39 out of 100. That's not looking too good. And the margin of safety is 0%. Here's some other features within. You can create your own custom dashboard. I like to set up and take a look at the top gainers and losers in the last 24 hours. I also like to take a look at the top search stocks, but you can really customize the dashboard to whatever you want. We have stocks, ETFs, crypto. This is a big one. We have a watch list tool that allows you to add stocks to the watch list. And if anything changes, such as that score or margin of safety, you automatically get notified. I call it the, the set it and forget it feature. And then we have portfolio trackers and alerts. So if you're looking for strong stocks, want to avoid bad stocks and learn how to invest, I invite you to join Ticker for free. 
What advice do you have for CTOs looking to start a business or maybe maybe even the CTO out there who's with a startup that wants to maybe jump to another startup or or maybe jump into corporate? We'll we'll break break down the first one first. Like any CTOs out there looking to start a company, what advice do you have? I think the biggest thing as far as the from a technical perspective is to really focus on the business. What is the problem that we're trying to solve? And that's a challenge that a lot of us technologists have is we've got a huge toolbox of all sorts of tools and ways that we can solve problems. And that's our superpower is our ability to solve problems in many different ways. And that's what we want to do. But we don't always understand what the problem is. We don't dive deep enough into what is it that we're trying to solve. We just start trying to solve things. Um, So I always encourage folks to kind of take a step back and really understand the problem really, really understand the problem and then start with something simple. Um, And as we can evolve, we can then bring in all of those fun new technologies and those tools that we have in our toolbox uh, to continue to grow and evolve and build a a bigger business upon that. Mm -hmm. Um, But really trying to kind of restrain ourselves from bringing technology into the equation for as long as possible. And that's, that's tough, right? That's why we're all in technology is because we love those things so much. Yes. You, what you just described there separates the lead software engineer from the CTO. Because I've met so many people out there that fall into that category of like, you're a better fit for lead software engineer because you're bringing all these tools, but not once did you ask me, how does this business make money? What pain is the customer going through? How do we resolve that pain? And then bring in the tech. I think any listeners out there, this is a good takeaway if you're interviewing for a CTO is what are they more focused on the tech and the toys or how to really solve problems for the customer and make money. That's where the CTO that's like, okay, you're checking one of the boxes of many to find a good CTO. If you can, if they start answering the questions correctly in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. Right on. All right. Let's jump to AI. Since that's a hot topic, how do you see AI really impacting or changing startups over the next five years? As far as startups go, I think AI is going to be an absolute game changer, right? We're experiencing a shift in the way that we live and work and operate like we, we haven't seen before, right? Or, you know, compare it to the advent of the internet and our ability to get access to information uh, in such a way. You know, I think AI is, is really, really interesting. It's really fascinating. I think it's extremely powerful. Uh, you know, from a, a software development standpoint, we're able to create more software, better, faster, at, you know, at a higher quality. Uh, and so I think that's going to really kind of change things. I think it's going to open up a lot of opportunities for smaller uh, startups to start to to kind of come out and evolve. Right. So I'm looking and I'm seeing a lot more kind of these micro SaaS applications that are very focused on a very target market, very niche problem that it's solving, they don't need huge user bases in order to be successful. Uh, They're able to survive with 500 or 1,000 monthly users, and they're doing really, really well. And I think those are only going to continue to to continue to proliferate out there. Um, So I'm excited about that for sure. I have a question here that you probably didn't see coming, but I was asked this question on a, a podcast a few weeks ago. Before I was on, the guests let me know I had some well-known VC on, I won't say the name, but they said that the SaaS market has become oversaturated and it's kind of leveling out. And my response was, I completely disagree. I think that um, there can always be a better mousetrap. There can be better UI, better experiences, products that provide less clicks. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, that comment about maybe SaaS leveling out. Do you think that's true? No, I would agree. I don't know that it's necessarily leveling out. I think we're seeing more players come into the game that are doing a better job solving more specific uh, problems for different, uh, you know, either use cases or industries. I think we're going to continue to see sort of those things. Maybe where I could see that comment coming from was we might not see as many big SaaS platforms that kind of encompass everything and our entire day and all of the work that we do lives within one SaaS platform. I do think that we're going to continue to see more SaaS products that we have to interact with day in and day out. 
And we're seeing more products that kind of sit in between a group of products and, and kind of serve as integration points to be able to pull information from one source and transform it, move it into another or, you know, the scheduling calendar invites. And, you know, I think we're going right. to see a lot more of that type of SaaSes uh, come out, you know, and there's always an opportunity to continue to improve what we build and how we build it. And the users are going to be the ones to tell us how well we're doing. Right, right. Good call. I agree. Um, this kind of connects the dots to our our audience. We have a lot of retail investors, uh, myself being one, not just an entrepreneur, but I really enjoy investing in the stock markets. And I do teach our audience that, you know, SaaS is a great area to look for because of the scalability, you can increase revenue without increasing your liabilities as fast, meaning payroll being one of the biggest liabilities. Unlike an agency or a service business, you increase your revenue, you usually got to increase your payroll. Um, so we love SaaS and there's always good SaaS investment opportunities, but for the, uh, in the entrepreneurs out there looking to create a SaaS, what advice would you have them? What would be a good starting point? Again, focusing on the problem. What is it that you're trying to solve? Who is your target audience? And being very, very, very specific about that, right? There's seven or 8 billion people in the world. We don't need to solve a problem for all of them. We need to solve it for a very, very narrow niche, right? I, I was talking with uh, a group of colleagues earlier today, and they're building an AI for dentists, right? It, it's just starting to really narrow it down. It's like my ideal customer is an, uh, you know, a practicing dentist, and they want to be able to ask questions and receive responses. And the interface between them and, you know, an AI platform or that SaaS platform is going to look a lot different than some of the others. Uh, so I think it's, it's really important to focus on what is it that we're doing and who are we serving? Right on. And then what advice do you have for founders out there looking to scale a SaaS? Try and keep things as simple as possible as you continue to grow. I think that's one of the things that really uh, challenges us is we make the solution so complex that it's very hard to actually scale the solution. Uh, you know, we need to try and add more servers and add more users and add more features and all of that complexity combined, it, it can be just overwhelming. And so if we add artificial complexity on top of that, it's almost always a recipe for disaster. So I really encourage folks to just kind of keep things as simple as possible. And then as the application grows, it may grow in unpredicted ways. And so just kind of pay attention to where customers are using the platform, how they're using it, because it may inform new product features uh, and new development efforts that you know you might not have had on your roadmap 12 or 18 months ago. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, let's jump into the rapid fire round next. This is part of the episode where we get to find out who Brian really is. If you can try to answer each question in about 15 seconds or less. You ready? Uh, ready as I'll ever be. <laughs> All right. Here we go. What is your favorite podcast? Uh, one I'm listening to a lot right now is the Tribe of Millionaires podcast. So it's a uh, uh, mastermind group or it kind of surrounds a mastermind group called Go Abundance. Uh, bring it on a lot of really interesting guests. So I really enjoy that one right now. I'll put it on the list. All right, next up, what is a recent book you read and would recommend? 10X is better than 2X. Uh, Dan Sullivan, uh, Dr. Benjamin Hardy. That's uh, a fantastic one. Yep, I've heard that recommendation before. Nice. All right, so what is your favorite movie? I love cheeky humor. So Dumb and Dumber for me, the original Dumb and Dumber oh. movie. Nice, going back to the 90s. Sweet. All right. So what is the worst advice you ever received? Uh, follow your passion and you'll never work a day in your life. Um, I'll, I'll give a little bit of color to that one. Uh, so, you know, I my passion is outdoor recreation. I love to go and explore and do things outdoors, um, but it was in direct conflict with some of my other goals, my other life goals. And so I actually had to come back to the drawing board and realize I needed uh, a shift in my career. Uh, to be able to achieve, you know, certain financial and, you know, other type of goals. And so I, I had to really kind of uh, change my approach there. I love that. Just to drill in that a little further, uh, Kevin O'Leary from Shark Tank has mentioned the same thing, where if you follow your passion, and in many cases, because he's a guitarist, he's always been playing the guitar, was he going to make 
was he going to become a multimillionaire as a guitarist? Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> Set those expectations, you know? And you want to find out, okay, so what can make money? And when you start to learn what does and starts helping people at the same time, you realize that you actually have a passion for that as well. It kind of develops. And mm -hmm. same thing in IT. I kind of fell into IT as well. I didn't see that happening when I was much younger, but it's like, okay, so this solves a problem and you can make money at this. Awesome. All right. You know, other hobbies out there still have interest in, but I'm not going pro at golf anytime soon. <laughs> but, you know, you, you get it. You're an outdoorsman. It's like, mm, you're not going to be able to financially get to where you want to be. You can still enjoy it, but you got to find something that makes money. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. All right. Flip that equation. What is the best advice you ever received? Uh, my dad says, slow down to speed up. Um, I think, you know, certainly when I was younger, I had a, a tendency to just want to jump in and do things very quickly. Um, and the results kind of spoke for themselves. And so really slowing down, being more methodical, uh, understanding what it is I'm doing before I start doing it. Um, you know, I was able to actually move much more quickly Right on. as a result. As the U.S. Special Forces say, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. I love that. Yeah. All right. Last question here is the time machine question. If you could go back in time to give your younger self advice, what age would you visit and what would you say? Um. I think I would probably go back to maybe my early 20s. Um, I think that would be an opportunity to really try and, you know, we don't have a lot of the same obligations. We don't have a family and a mortgage and really taking advantage of that period of time to really go and explore new things, right? New countries and cultures and people. I think, uh, you know, that's that's something that now, I, that I have an opportunity, I do have a bit more flexibility and, you know, financial stability. I'm trying to, to bring that into my life. Um, you know, it just, it would have been uh, fun to do it at that period of, of my life as well. So. Right on. All right. And where can people reach you? I, I'm most active on LinkedIn. So I always encourage folks to reach out uh, and find me there. I'm happy to connect and would love to uh, have a chat. Awesome. All right, Brian. Well, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. John, thank you. We'll see ya.